I tell my students, <laughs> whether we're doing privates or otherwise, I say, you know, anytime you are in a session with me, this is an opportunity for you to act as if, yeah. <laughs> right? Act yeah. as if I am your client, I am your, uh, you know, your, your audio producer, I am your whatever. Get in the booth, record as if you are, you know, record yourself. Each time it's an opportunity for you to work with your gear and to, to do these things, right? Because the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. And if yeah. you don't do it, then you're wasting an opportunity. George the Tech. Hey, everybody. It's George the Tech. I love doing these trusted partner profiles, and we've got another one for you, this time with Debbie Irwin. How you doing, Debbie? I'm doing great. How are you, George? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Yeah, so we've been talking to all of the great partners that we have been forming over the years in the voiceover business because there's so much good out there. But we really want you to tell our audience a little bit about what makes you unique, how you got started in the voiceover business, and then a little bit about your program. So give me a little background. Tell me about yourself and, and how voiceover came into your life and how long have you been working at it? My voice is probably an octave lower than it normally is. And mm. if, uh, if this were a paid session, I would have contacted you ahead of time and given you the, uh, the choice of continuing to have this session <laughs> <laughs> or not. So, yeah, so I've been at this thing for uh, a little over 20 years. And um, if for those of you at home, if you can see that all the gray hair, uh, I've got lots of um, I've had some past lives prior to uh, voiceover. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wish I knew about voiceover prior to having found it. What um, was your what was your career immediately prior to voiceover? Like where, when you really transitioned to a full time voiceover, what were you doing? I was full time mom. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. Yep, enough full said. time, full time, <laughs> no, enough said, right? Full time mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> full time, full time Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and prior to Sesame Street, I was full time Wall Street as oh, a stockbroker. Wow. <laughs> wow, okay. And prior to Wall Street, I was full time Guggenheim Museum. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, doing PR and special events. And prior to Guggenheim Museum, I was full time struggling stage actress in New York City. So see, uh, all of these little elements, these foundational building blocks, sent you to where you are today. That is absolutely, positively, 1,000% correct. <laughs> That's right. So you have such a unique set of backgrounds and skills, and all of that's informed your voiceover mm -hmm. career. And so you spent these years building that voiceover career. How has that uh, taken you to the journey of becoming a coach? That's a good question. Um, so I started coaching um, really in the pandemic. I mean, I was already speaking um, and presenting at various conferences on the topic of medical narration. And people would come up to me afterwards and say, oh, do you coach? And I'd say, well... Someday I'll get around to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. And At the moment I'm too busy voice yeah, acting, and, yeah, oh, and that's I my just, yeah. And then, and then, thanks to um, Rhonda Phillips, actually, she said, "You know what? I'm going to give you the kick in the arse that you need to actually get started with this." And um, so. It's been wonderful. I really, really love it because not only is it exciting to help other people and share what it is that I know, and in fact, in the beginning, I was like, I don't know, what do I know, right? You know, <laughs> and you realize, hmm, I guess I do know a lot. And then it's like, well, how do I, how do I um, concretize what it is that I know? How do I organize what it is that I know? And then the process of teaching, you're actually learning, right? You're learning how to how to teach because not everybody learns the same way, right? Mm -hmm. And so in teaching, I'm learning. And it's such a gratifying process um, when you see people grow and when you see the light bulb go on. And yeah. it's, very, it's very different from – it's a very different gratification than performing. 
um, which is its own incredible, incredibly satisfying, unique. Unlike anything else, I have three kids and I adore them to the moon. But after they were whatever age and I was looking for something to go back, you know, the, the joy of acting, there's nothing that replaces what happens for someone, you know, it's a creative thing that happens. I don't know. I'm really yeah. not feeling very articulate right now, so I'll let you ask me the next question. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I realized I was learning to teach as a as a young person. I was teaching summer science class, summer science camp. Really, as a middle school aged person, I was teaching. I was teaching third graders, and then wow. as a high school kid, I got to run my own classroom. Little wow. did I know I was learning all those skills in the back. I didn't know I was going to be needing this later in life. Yeah. You know, I want, I want to be an engineer. I want to be a tech person. But boy, all that has been so helpful for me. And I love the gratification of people feeling empowered and feeling confident after what they've learned. Right. Isn't it the best feeling? It, it really, really is. You know, it's the old, you know, you can, you can, uh, what's the saying? You can uh, lead a horse to water. No, no, not that one. It's the <laughs> teaching somebody to fish, right? Teaching, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right, exactly. Right? Um, yeah, and the other thing is some, some you know, some corollary is that the the time that I spent on Wall Street was probably the most helpful for me in being successful in this mm. career because it really was building a business and. Uh, even though on Wall Street I had the infrastructure of a m- massive organization. Right. First I was at Dean Witter and then Smith Barney. So, you know, all that marketing, you know, that marketing engine was there for me. But still, I had to smile and dial. I had to reach out and develop those relationships and mm. and and maintain those relationships with people, which is what we have to do, you know, here. Um, Did you carry any relationships over? From Wall what? Street into voiceover? I mean, you that know, would be the wildest thing. One. One. One, actually. And um, oh. so it wasn't, actually, it wasn't Wall Street. It was it was from the museum world. So, you know, I worked at the Guggenheim. And um, so I really wanted to do museum audio tours. And I reached out to someone that I knew who was, now mind you, I worked at the Guggenheim from 82 to 85. And at the point at which, you know, I was on Wall Street from 85 to 90, at the point at which I took my first VO class, this was 2003, okay? So at this point, like, nobody who I knew was still around at at the Guggenheim. But somebody who I knew who was at the Jewish Museum, still there. So I called her and I said, hey, this is what I'm doing now, who at the museum does your audio tours and she said i'm not sure but i'll find out so she put me in touch with the other department and they said well actually we don't really do them here we use acoustic guide mm. so she gave me the name of somebody and i started to get in touch with them and tried and tried and tried and it was really frustrating because i tried and they didn't really you know i what happened was what usually happens is you know you get no answer or they say sure no or you know we're too busy mm-hmm. or thank you no thank you mm-hmm. or what have you right so after many months i think i i got back in touch again and it turned out that the guy who i had been in touch with was no longer even there right and now somebody else had the job mm-hmm. and she invited me in to audition and i ended up started and working there for and did a number of jobs. I that's how I got the job as the voice of the Statue of Liberty, and I did actually work on nothing at the Jewish Museum, but at the Guggenheim. I did work for the Cooper Hewitt. I did work for the Smithsonian. I did work for the Met, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of that, and I talk to my students about that. You know, I say whatever all of your past lives and other things that you've done, those are huge ace cards that you're holding when you're ready to. Um, they're deep in there and to go to knock to be on those doors, conjured up yes. at the right time, and then they—it's like my teaching background that I didn't know I, I really had. It's, yes. It was there all along. Yeah, yeah, they're phenomenal resources for you. 
you mm-hmm. know. So, um, and that's one of the things too that I love about about coaching is that a lot of people who come to me have had other past lives. You know, they're not, you know, they're people who have done other things. They're, yes, they've been an anesthesiologist or a science writer or a teacher or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, and to me that's exciting because. In much the same way that on Wall Street, they like to hire people who were successful at something else, you know, because that showed that, all right, this person understands that it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, it takes persistence to to build something, to be successful, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have this pie-in-the-sky kind of notion that, oh, you know— yeah. I'll be able to do this really e- easily. Yeah, yeah. They have a. They come in. They come into you with a bit of a healthy expectation right. of maybe That's what they're be. what they're. So tell us briefly about your your program. What do, what do people? What can people expect that uh, decide to go with your coaching? What is there? Is this a lifelong connection? Is this going to be something that they do over a short course of time? How do you how do you roll out your training? It's really very individualized because it depends on where people are at. Yeah, um, it's not a formula. You're not you're not just <laughs> forcing people through a, a machine, no. quote unquote. No, yeah. no, uh, far far from it. And you really need to be at a certain level in order to work with me. You have to know what you're doing enough so that yeah, if you're really starting out, I'm not the right person for you. Because good to know you're you're um, at least a level two or level three coach. I would call that. Yeah. And and if you can't produce your own quality audio, I send them to somebody like you to say, look, you need to get your stuff set up so that when you come to me, um, you're already producing quality audio. You mm-hmm. already know how to edit your own audio mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that when we're working together um, and I give you assignments, which I do all the time, that you're going to go and record that and edit it and you're going to you know, send me that audio file. I'm going to listen to it before we get into our session together. And then I'm going to, we're going to work together on everything. And when I say everything, my perspective is very 360 degrees. Mm. And by that, I mean, look, it's not enough to be, you know, a good performer, right? To know how to analyze a script or deliver a script and be conversational or know how to pronounce those tongue-twisting terms, right? We are our own businesses. And especially now, post-COVID, and for many of us pre-COVID, 80% of the work I did prior to COVID, I did in my own studio, on my Mm -hmm. own, right? Um, So we you know, we have to be work ready. It's not enough to be demo ready. We have to know our gear. We have to be able to, um, you know, handle the technology, right? Because we're running our own sessions. We're wearing all those other hats, right? Maybe we're lucky and we have an engineer on the other end, but even with an engineer on the other end, we have to know that if they're asking us to, you know, if there's a problem either on our end or theirs, we have to know what we're supposed to be doing in order to solve that problem, right? Um, So that takes experience too. You can't just it, it's it's not enough to step up to the mic and just speak, right? And be good at that component. It's session notes. It's managing the stress of there being multiple people in the room when you are performing in mm-hmm. the session. And those multiple people, if you're lucky, there is an engineer. But beyond that, there can be a producer. There can be other creatives. There could be the, the writer and so on. And so managing all of those variables takes experience and it can be a stressful situation and also knowing you know what are the expectations and determining determining ahead of time what those deliverables are going to be so that it's clear right and as a funny example now (laughs) for some reason obvious maybe it's not obvious for some reason when you know when with all of those things that happen in the course of a session I have a very hard time remembering what take number we're on. 
So yeah. I make, you know, I make fun of myself. I say I'm a very mm-hmm. smart woman, but I can't remember if I'm on take one or two or three. So I need your help. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I need you to take very good session notes <laughs> yeah. and I'll take whatever notes I can here and then we'll confer at the end so that I'm sure that, you know, I'll send you the raw file and, and not everybody um, does this. Some people will just say, hey, I'm sending you the raw file. Or if we're working with Source Connect or, you know, another program like the one that we're on, right. you've got the audio in, in real time, so it's not even an issue. If you are um, providing selects and keeping notes and everything, you you want to have a, a system for managing all that information. Right. Absolutely, yeah. So you even get so, the, you get into that some of that nuts and bolts stuff. You know, when I teach, I do I offer mini intensives. I because medical is a lot of what I focus on. It's not all that I do, but I have I teach many um, medical mini intensives, yeah. and I tell my students <laughs> whether we're doing privates or otherwise. I say, you know, anytime you are in a session with me, this is an opportunity for you to act as if. Yeah. <laughs> right. Act yeah. as if I am your client. I am your, uh, you know, your your audio producer. I am your whatever. Each time, it's an opportunity for you to work with your gear and to to do these things, right? Because the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. And if yeah. you don't do it, then you you're wasting an opportunity. Right. Right. Oh, that's such a that's so valuable. Just to f- complete the loop on the three hundred and sixty. Mm-hmm. Wherever I see something that I think somebody can improve on, so if it has something to do with their website, if their contact information isn't clear, if there's no email signature, if it's something in the way that they ask, are asking a question in an email that, that they could have found that answer on their own, I'm going to point these things out to them, you know, because it's all about how they're interacting as well with people and yeah. not just you know, again, the performance. It's you're running a business and how, how do people want to be um, on the other side? How do they want to be treated and what are their expectations of the talent? You're teaching them to be micro-executives. Yeah, I think, yeah. You know? Yeah. And Because you, you came from that. You know what that world's like and you know the way they're going to be perceived in the real world. And that's something that is very hard to teach, but you're doing it. How can they work with you? That's the question. What's the best way for them to get a hold of you, and how would they start in coaching with you? Do you start with a evaluation to make sure they're ready to go? Mm-hmm. Yes, as a matter of fact. So on my website, there's a form that's um, you know you can indicate if you're interested in um, in speaking with me, and it asks you some questions about your background and. Um, so I get to know you a little bit before you set up a time to talk to me. Mm-hmm. And before anybody coaches with me, um, you do have to send me room tone. And I have sample scripts that people um, record to send me one. So I have a baseline, um, you know, to determine where they're at, right? Mm-hmm. And to get a sense of, okay, can I help this person? Do I have a sense of what some of their issues are. And sometimes people will be like, I'm stuck. This is what I think my issues are. Or is is do I stand a chance yeah. with medical? Yeah. Or uh, I'm curious to know about this. Uh, or I have a background in, in science and I'm curious, you know, or I do other kinds of voiceover, but I want to know more about medical. Mm-hmm. You know, so I offer privates and then I do group coaching and I'm actually starting to develop courses. Mm-hmm. So um, because there are only so many hours and I find right. that there are a lot of people who are who are interested. So I'm hoping to, well, I'm in the process of turning um, a webinar that I did very recently, which was, and thank you for helping to, um, to talk about it get online. It was, yeah, yeah, how to get started in medical narration. Mm-hmm. So I'm turning that into an interactive course, and uh, hopefully that'll be ready within the next few weeks for people to take advantage of and questions and answers. Absolutely. And stuff like that. So, so obviously they'll have a link to where they can join with you, but just in case, tell them yeah. the website where they need to go. Okay, it's my name, and it's one of those names, both first and last, that can be spelled a couple of different ways. Right. 
Debbie Irwin, and Debbie's D-E-B-B-I-E, and Irwin is I-R-W-I-N, DebbieIrwin.com. Pretty straightforward. You know, you never know, this might end up in audio (laughs) format, so (laughs) spelling it out is never a bad idea. Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate your uh, time, and I really learned something about you today, which is an extra cool bonus. I found out that you like that you used to teach younger kids in school, and I did that too. That yeah. was really, you know, science. That was a, it was. A I science didn't teach them science. Camp. I taught reading. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, science camp. I taught kids at uh, Franklin Institute Science Museum in Philadelphia. I oh. taught Girl Scout kids, or basically did science demonstrations for those kids. Do you remember like the liquid nitrogen show? You ever yeah. see one of those where they, yeah. I got to do that. I got to do the liquid nitrogen show as a teenager. Dang. That's it so was cool. Really cool. Thanks for the pleasure of uh, spending some time with you. It's always good. <laughs> oh, yeah. You too. Thank you for your time. And uh, I know our clients are going to benefit so much from this. So thank you. All right. My <laughs> pleasure. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.